brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that sends 5% of your monthly plan price to your favorite charity. No contracts, nationwide coverage, risk-free guarantee. Learn more at CharityMobile.com. We continue our weekend educational material by looking at or continuing our journey through St. Vincent of Laren's work, The Combinatory, which I will remind you, I decided to do this, start this more than a year ago now because Francis started quoting St. Vincent of Laren's as justification for changing aspects of the faith, teachings of the faith. He wouldn't ever characterize it as changing the faith, but that's what the argument he was making. And I knew that had to be nonsense, so I got a copy of the book that he was quoting, and it turned out it was nonsense. And so we've been working through this the whole year. And now we're going to get to a particularly relevant passage from the Combinatory. It's on the nature of the faith itself, and on clinging to the deposit of the faith, to staying rigid to the deposit of the faith. Remember, Bishop Strickland was told not to talk about the deposit of the faith by authorities in Rome. Bear that in mind as we go over this. Chapter 22, continuing with the exposition of 1 Timothy on staying true to the faith. But it is worthwhile to expound the whole of that passage of the Apostle more fully. O Timothy, keep the deposit, avoiding profane novelties of words. Oh, the exclamation implies foreknowledge as well as charity. For he mourned in anticipation over the errors which he foresaw. Who is the Timothy of today but either generally the universal church, or in particular, the whole body of the prelacy, whom it behooves either themselves to possess or to communicate to others a complete knowledge of religion? What is keep the deposit? Keep it because of thieves, because of adversaries, lest while men sleep they sow tares over good wheat which the Son of Man had sown in his field keep the deposit. What is the deposit? That which has been entrusted to thee, not that which thou hast thyself devised, a matter not of wit, but of learning, not of private adoption, but of public tradition, a matter brought to thee, not put forth by thee, wherein thou art bound to be. An author, but a keeper, not a teacher, but a disciple, not a leader, but a follower. Keep the deposit. Preserve the talent of Catholic faith inviolate, unadulterate, that which has been entrusted to thee, let it continue in thy possession. Let it be handed on by thee. Thou hast received gold. Give gold in return. Do not substitute one thing for another. Do not, do not for gold impudently substitute lead or brass. Give real gold, not counterfeit. O Timothy, O priest, O expositor, O doctor, if the divine gift hath qualified thee by wit, by skill, by learning... Be thou basilial of the spiritual tabernacle. Engrave the precious gems of divine doctrine. Fit them in accurately. Adorn them skillfully. Add splendor, grace, beauty. Let that which formerly was believed, though imperfectly apprehended, as expounded by thee, be clearly understood. Let posterity welcome, understood through thy exposition, what antiquity venerated without understanding. Yet teach still the same truths which thou hast learned, so that thou speakest after a new fashion, what thou speakest may not be new. On development, chapter 23, on development and religious knowledge. But some will, someone will say, perhaps, shall there then be no progress in Christ's church? Certainly, all possible progress. For what being is there, so envious of men, so full of hatred to God, who would seek to forbid it? yet on condition that it be real progress, not alteration of the faith. For progress requires that the subject be enlarged in itself, alteration, that it be transformed into something else. The intelligence, then, the knowledge, the wisdom, as well as of individuals as of all, as well as of one man as of the whole church, ought in the course of ages and centuries to increase and make much and vigorous progress, but yet only in its own kind, that is to say, in the same doctrine, in the same sense, and in the same meaning. The growth of religion in the soul must be analogous to the growth of the body, which, though in process of years it is developed and attains its full size, yet remains still the same. There is a wide difference between the flower of youth and the maturity of age. Yet they who were once young are still the same now that they have become old. 
insomuch that though the stature and outward form of the individual are changed, yet his nature is one and the same, his person is one and the same. An infant's limbs are small, a young man's large, yet the infant and the young man are the same. Men, when full grown, have the same number of joints that they had when children. And if there be any to which mature age has given birth, these were already present in embryo, so that nothing new is produced in them when old, which was not already latent in them when children. This, then, is undoubtedly the true and legitimate rule of progress. This, the established and most beautiful order of growth, that mature age ever develops in the man whose parts and forms which the wisdom of the Creator had already framed beforehand in the infant. Whereas, if the human form were changed into some shape belonging to another kind, or at any rate, if the number of its limbs were increased or diminished, the result would be that the whole body would become either a wreck or a monster, or at the least would be impaired and enfeebled. In like manner, it behooves Christian doctrine to follow the same laws of progress, so as to be consolidated by years, enlarged by time, refined by age, and yet withal to continue uncorrupt and unadulterate, complete and perfect in all the measurement of its parts, and so to speak, in all its proper members and senses, admitting no change, no waste of its distinctive property, no variation in its limits. For example, our fathers in the old times sowed wheat in the church's field. It would be most unmeet and iniquitous if we, their descendants, instead of the genuine truth of corn, should reap the counterfeit error of tares. This rather should be the result. There should be no discrepancy between the first and the last. From doctrine which was sown as wheat we should reap, in the increase, doctrine of the same kind, wheat also, so that when in process of time any of the original seed is developed and now flourishes under cultivation, no change may ensue in the character of the plant. There may supervene shape, form, variation, and outward appearance, but the nature of each kind must remain the same. God forbid that those rose beds of Catholic interpretation should be converted into thorns and thistles. God forbid that in the spiritual paradise from plants of cinnamon and balsam darnel and wolfsbane should of a sudden shoot forth. Therefore, whatever hath been sown by the fidelity of the fathers in this husbandry of God's church, the same ought to be cultivated and taken care of by the industry of their children. The same ought to flourish and ripen. The same ought to advance and go forward to perfection. For it is right that those ancient doctrines of heavenly philosophy should, as time goes on, be cared for, smoothed, polished, but not that they should be changed, not that they should be twisted and perverted towards a different end. They may receive proof, illustration, definitiveness, but they must retain with all their completeness, their integrity, their characteristic properties. For if once this license of impious fraud be admitted, I dread to say in how great danger religion will be of being utterly destroyed and annihilated. For if any one part of Catholic truth be given up, Another and another and another will thenceforth be given up as a matter of course, and the several individual portions having been rejected, what will follow in the end but the rejection of the whole? On the other hand, if what is new begins to be mingled with what is old, foreign with domestic, profane with sacred, the custom of necessity creep on universally, till at last the church will have nothing left untampered with, nothing unadulterated, nothing sound, nothing pure. But where formerly there was a sanctuary of chaste and undefiled truth, Thenceforth there will be a brothel of impious and base errors. May God's mercy avert this wickedness from the minds of his servant, be it rather the frenzy of the ungodly. But the Church of Christ, the careful and watchful guardian of the doctrines deposited in her charge, never changes anything in them, never diminishes, never adds, does not cut off what is necessary, does not add what is superfluous, does not lose her own, does not appropriate what is another's. But while dealing faithfully and judiciously with ancient doctrine, keeps this one object carefully in view. If there be anything which antiquity has left shapeless and rudimentary, to fashion and polish it, if anything already reduced to shape and developed, to consolidate and strengthen it, if any already ratified and defined, to keep and guard it. Finally, what other object have councils ever aimed at in their decrees than to provide that which was before believed in its simplicity should in future be believed intelligently, that what was before preached coldly should in future be preached earnestly? that what was before practiced negligently should thenceforward be practiced with double solicitude. This, I say, is what the Catholic Church, roused by the novelties of heretics, has accomplished by the decrees of her councils. This and nothing else. She has thenceforward consigned to posterity in writing what she had received from those of olden times only by tradition, comprising a great amount of matter in a few words, and often, for the better understanding, designating an old article of the faith by the characteristic of a new name. In other words, the church does not change what she teaches, and to do so 
when a single change happens, you can bet that more changes will follow. And have we not seen that in our time? We had a great upheaval in the church beginning in the late 1950s, although the seeds for it were sown well before that. And then they had their council and they began to change things. How the mass was offered, who could participate in the mass at the altar, how the Eucharist was given to the laity. And of course, many bishops tried to change the moral teachings of the faith sowing great confusion and scandal among the laity. And here St. Vincent of Lawrence told us that this would happen, that once you begin to change things, it would be inevitable that everything would be up for grabs. I want you to think about this in the, in the terms of the Synod on Synodality and the Instrumentum Laboris that was released for it a couple of weeks ago, where you see now every moral quandary of the secular world, everything that they want, that the church has always stood against, now seems to be open to discussion. Pray for the church, folks, as I always say. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. Is this sharing this on social media? That helps too. I'm Anthony Stein, and as always, pray for the church. Ave Maria.